Our next guest is Jeff Malkin. Jeff is a fearless entrepreneur with a strong track record in technology startups. He's been the CEO founder of two venture-backed companies in the past decade. Before Encoding.com, he was founding CEO of Raz, a technology company in the mobile and social media space. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Marty. I uh, appreciate the opportunity today to, uh, to talk about um, how to leverage cloud-based platforms and cloud-based service providers to power the universal delivery of video. With the increasing number of uh, devices that people are using to watch their videos today, whether it be iOS, iPhones, iPads, Androids, tablets, phablets, set-top boxes, smart TVs, it's becoming increasingly challenging for content providers to successfully deliver video um, and to do it at scale. So today I'm going to talk about why it's so complex and then how to leverage cloud to resolve those challenges. So before diving in too deep, let's first talk about what are the core components that you as a content provider, producer, you know, distributor have to uh, put in place in order to take a video off a camera and be able to deliver it seamlessly to all these different devices. So regardless of whether you uh, use an on-premise solution or build your own solutions through cloud-based providers, there are certain things you have to do. You have to have a storage solution where you can store your source video assets uh, and, uh, and add metadata to describe those assets. You need a transcoding solution. So you need a solution where you'll be able to ingest formats from all different sorts of cameras and whatnot and be able to create all the different output profiles for successful delivery. Included within transcoding, you have to manage things like closed captioning and digital rights management, and we'll talk more about that. You'll need a hosting solution. Uh, how do you deliver video content globally um, and seamlessly and securely? You'll need uh, a video player solution. Right? The end user is, you know, how do they start and stop your video? How do they share your videos? Whether it's a native player on a mobile device or whether it's a flash player that you build for the web. Um, most likely, uh, you'll need a monetization solution. We're all in the business of making money, whether it's ad-supported or uh, subscriber-based or you know, VPOP or SVOD or any other acronyms we can come up with. And you'll need to know um, who's watching your video, how often they're watching your video, what's the engagement level, where are they dropping off, et cetera. So now um, that you know what core components are required for delivering multi-screen video, um, you know, let's dive into the specifics of why it's so challenging. The overarching theme here is that there is a, a lack of standardization across the increasing number of devices and browsers in market. Um, and that's true for video formats, for closed captioning formats, for DRM encryption formats, et cetera. So let's start with video formats. Um, on this slide, I've included a graph that describes uh, uh, some popular browsers and what video formats that they support, you know, what's their default format. You know, you can pause the video and, and take a look at it, but, you know, let's just say the complexity. Um, on web browsers, you have HTML5 versus Flash. On HTML5, meaning that you can play video natively within the browser, that was, you know, supposed to be a, uh, a, a dream where you can have one video format and it would work seamlessly. Of course, all the competing browsers support their own default video formats. You have iOS versus Android. You know, what's supported on those devices is not necessarily the same. And the real challenge here is that it's continuously innovating. It's never ending. So what you support today, in six months from now and 12 months from now, is not what's going to be necessarily what's supported in the market. Uh, an important trend in universal video delivery is adaptive bitrate delivery. So what is that? It's a framework where an end user's device is continually pinging the, avail the network for available bandwidth, and then the ability to switch the video stream to a higher or a lower quality video in order to maximize the quality while minimizing the buffering. Um, it's, there's actually four competing adaptive bitrate formats now. Apple has what's called HTTP live streaming, Microsoft has pl uh, smooth streaming, Adobe has HTTP dynamic streaming, and then there's MPEG dash. Um, certainly one of the challenges you're going to face is as you're targeting multiple devices, you likely have to support multiple adaptive bitrate formats. So let's talk about why it's so complex to manage adaptive bitrate delivery. Um, I'll focus on uh, Apple's HTTP live streaming or HLS it's called. 
HLS has become the more dominant adaptive bitrate delivery formats now supported not only on iOS devices, but also on the newer Android devices, some of the set-top boxes like Roku, and I believe that even the newest version of Xbox, believe it or not, actually supports HLS now. So let's take an example. Let's take a one um, long-form television episode, a 44-minute video file. So what you're gonna do to prepare it for adaptive bitrate is you're gonna take that one 44-minute video and you're gonna chunk it into 10 second or less segments. Apple recommends 10 seconds. Within each of those 10 second segments, you're gonna slice it into six different bit rates with the lowest quality being a uh, audio only bit stream with a still image. And now each of those video segments, the six segments within each of the 10 second segments has its own stream instruction file. It's called an M3U8 file. And then this all gets wrapped together with a master M3U8 file. That's a lot more detail than you need. However, we've just taken one video and we've turned it into several thousand video segments wrapped in all these stream instruction files and that's just for one television episode. So imagine now you have multiple episodes per day, hundreds per week, thousands per month. You now can see the complexity of scaling up adaptive, adaptive bit rate delivery. Closed captioning similarly um, has challenges around the fragmentation of the market. So uh, if you are a premium content provider or broadcaster, you already know that content that you've broadcast that you now want to uh, deliver over the internet has to include captions. The challenge is, of course, that what you broadcast with captions, which are burned in captions, called CEA 608 is the format, um, is only supported on some of the, the, the digital um, uh, devices that you'll be targeting. Uh, many of the devices support what's called sidecar files, where you take the captions, include them as a text file alongside the video. Of course, there's many different competing sidecar file formats. So once again, if you're targeting which to maximize your viewership, iOS devices, Android devices, and all the other devices, you're going to have to transcode and include multiple closed captioning formats as well. Uh, for premium content providers, you have to manage digital rights management. The complexity here is that for uh, packaging and encrypting files, uh, while there are many competing formats like Widevine or PlayReady or Adobe Primetime or Verimatrix or Marlin, et cetera, um, what you're doing is you're taking the source video asset during the transcode process, you're encrypting it, you have to register, create keys, generate those keys, register them with a the key hosting provider, and then provide a player that handshakes with that key to make sure that the end user has the rights to watch that video. Again, at scale, this becomes a massive headache. And then there's um, lots of editing automation you do when you're publishing video. Uh, you may not think of this as editing, but say you want to add your logo to videos, as I'm sure, you know, Marty, you'll probably do for these videos, right? Or you want to concatenate and add bumpers on the front and back of your videos, or you want to stitch ads together, or you want to add Nielsen watermarking for tracking views on iOS devices, et cetera. This all has to happen at scale during the transcode process. And then, of course, you'll need a hosting solution. Um, and for a hosting solution for delivering all this video, uh, you'll most likely use a content delivery network with the ability to uh, deliver video globally and minimize buffering and deliver it securely. But now that you've created all of these different output profiles for each source video so that it plays back successfully on all these devices, you'll, you'll want a solution that actually has the ability to detect what device and browser the end user is using. So that should be part of your overall solution. So now I've described a bunch of challenges related to scaling up and delivering uh, universal video. There's a lot more. Unfortunately, we only have a few minutes here, so I'm um, describing the major ones. But um, now let's talk about how we can leverage cloud and cloud-based service providers to resolve those challenges. You know, leveraging cloud really becomes one of the ways to look at it is a CapEx versus an OpEx model. Um, if you're managing all of these components and all of this video processing in-house, you're doing it on-premise using lots of compute power, lots of compute resources. And uh, oftentimes, I've worked with thousands of CTOs over the last you know, six years with this company, and it's very difficult to predict your, the volumes that you need to manage. So it's very spiky and very peaky in nature. So you either over-invest in a lot of computing horsepower and you have a lot of computers laying around doing nothing, or more often than not, you underinvest and have long video queues backing up and lots of angry internal or external you know, uh, uh, customers. So leveraging the cloud and the elastic capacity of cloud, you can dynamically spin up and spin down resources as you need them. And it's a much more efficient approach to managing uh, the, the, the spiky volumes. In addition, and in theory, leveraging cloud, you have unlimited computing resources. So you know, your cloud provider 
or your cloud solution should be able to handle whether you send them 100 videos you know, in a minute, in a second, 1,000 videos, because they can be able to, uh, and then within each of those videos, do all of that output profiles and all, those, all that processing in parallel. And you can leverage you know, all of this cloud computing to manage that um, in real time. And if you are uh, a, a news provider or sports or whatever speed is critical of getting video to market, you need a cloud solution to handle all that load. And then finally, flexibility. You know, as I've talked about, not only is this world uh, very fragmented, um, but it continuously changes. So um, by bu building together a video workflow where you, where you can stitch together uh, best of breed components from third party cloud based providers, not only is it their job to stay on top of the latest and greatest as all these new formats come to market, but if you're not happy with any of your providers, you need the modularity and the flexibility to be able to swap in and swap out providers. And leveraging the cloud to do that is very effective. So in conclusion, um, you know, the you know, primary objective here with video is to deliver high quality video to as many users as possible, right? You don't want to you know, miss out on certain devices and certain platforms. And so therefore, you know, with every source video that you create, you're likely to be creating anywhere from 10 to 30 output profiles. I believe Netflix today does 200 output profiles per video. Uh, in order to scale that with that massive computing power requirements and be able to have a system that is flexible enough to withstand the changes and the innovation that continues to occur, uh, leveraging cloud is a great way to transition.